Imagine, if you will, it's Sabbath in heaven. Two saints fall into step along with one another on the way to church. And they strike up a conversation. One says to the other, I lived in the United States of America down in the early 21st century. Why, so did I, says the other. I was from Arizona. Well, what do you know? I'm from Arizona, too. I was a member of the Sierra Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, now, this is hard to believe. So was I. And they had to go to heaven to get acquainted. I want to talk this morning about friendship. I'm inclined to think that friendship is probably the most godlike love that humans can experience. Being a friend is better than being part of a family because brothers and sisters, parents and children sometimes wind up hating each other. After all, these are often relationships that are not chosen. Being a friend is better than being a sweetheart because sweethearts who are not friends soon drift apart. Romance is sometimes like a flower, beautiful but temporary. Friendship is like a tree, sheltering, lasting. I wish so much to lay an idea into your head this morning that will just bother you all week long. The idea is this. There is someone who would be in church if you would befriend them. There is someone not here who would be here if they really knew that you cared about them. Somewhere out there for nearly every person present this morning, I am sure there is someone who would be here if they thought you cared. I invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John. It's a passage that emerges read. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Our friendship passage. John chapter 15, verses 12 to 15. John 15, beginning with verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. I would suggest this morning that Christian friendship means befriending others in the same way that Christ befriended us. Verse 12 again, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And many times I think we have limited and perhaps misunderstood that passage, that little word as, as I have loved you. Some of us interpret that as meaning that we should love one another just as surely as he loves us. And while that is certainly true, it's saying more directly that we should love others in the same way that he loves us. The Good News Bible translates it this way, love one another just as I love you. The Message Bible, love one another the way I loved you. Christian love, then, is befriending people in the same way that Christ befriends us. Verse 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You see, Jesus' friends befriend as he befriended. 
I can say this morning that I choose not to make friendship a part of my religion. I then choose to make my religion something other than Christian. I can say this morning, I'm too timid. I can say, I'm too busy. But I cannot then say that I am Christ's. Friendship and love for one another is the first proof of our friendship with and love for Jesus. The saints are sometimes called the cream, and I think they are that, but too many times it's the ice cream. How long since you invited a friend to church? There's someone out there who would be in church if you would befriend them. Now, there are some uniquenesses and differences between just common friendship and Christian friendship. Christian friendship is putting others first. Christian friendship changes our priorities. John 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Such a noble thing. We admire that. And we presume here that it's talking about martyrdom, the ultimate sacrifice. May I suggest that maybe we have limited this verse too much as well. A man lay down his life for his friends. I'll die so that my friend might live. Let me read it again. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In other words, it may also be talking about laying down my way of living, my lifestyle, my priorities for the sake of a friend. It's not only martyrdom, it's saying I will go out of my way, I will turn my life aside a bit for a friend. That's become very apparent to me since I retired, you know, we look forward to retiring. It's been a little over 10 years now that I've been retired. And I always looked forward to, you know, those golden years. And I was going to be able to sleep in, which I do. Control my schedule, do what I want to do, when I want to do it. It was going to be that really special time. And I found <laughs> over the last 10 years, I've had a number of my grandchildren that we've helped to raise. And then it was like not being retired all over again. Adjusting your schedule, adjusting your priorities. That's the one thing I don't compromise on. I still sleep in. I had to get up at 2 in the morning when I worked at the post office for over 30 years. So I... I, I still enjoy that, but you get the point. Being able to readjust your priorities, your lifestyle, your wishes, adjusting those and turning those aside for the sake of a friend. Most of us love to have friends, but we don't like to have our own preferences turned aside. Christian friendship is caring enough to take time, time to bake a cherry pie, time to fix the neighbor's car, time to invite a friend over to spend time together. We claim that we're too busy, and I hope if we learn nothing else, we'll go away convinced that that's nonsense. Our problem is not that we are too busy. Our problem is that we are too disinterested and too uncaring. Our priorities need to be changed. You cannot do everything you want to do for yourself and have time left over to help somebody else. But if you are more concerned with helping somebody else than doing everything you want for yourself, you have plenty of time. Our problem is not busyness. Our problem is lack of caring. Now, there's a vast difference between just friendship and Christian friendship. Friendship can be satisfied if you come to church this morning sitting with your boyfriend or girlfriend, sitting with your family, or sitting with someone whom you call a friend. That will satisfy just friendship. 
But Christian friendship is never satisfied so long as one person in the congregation has to worship alone. Are you just a friend? Or are you a Christian friend? Now it takes a lot of Christianity for an older person, I believe, to be a Christian friend. Because typically an older person has so many regular friends that they've cultivated over the years. He doesn't need friends. He has his hands full of friends. And since he has plenty of friends, he sometimes finds it difficult to understand that he's surrounded by people who feel they don't have friends. And so the hardest people to get busy befriending other people are the pillars in the church. They already have their circle of friends. They don't understand the need for friends. When you go off to academy or to college, it doesn't take long for the newness to wear off and the loneliness to set in. The hardest student to get interested in helping a lonely student is the student who's already established and settled in school because they already have their circle of friends. An author by the name of Gerald Moore writes a lesson from two stories, two experiences from his own life. The first experience, he was traveling in an automobile, sitting alongside his wife who was driving. Suddenly headlights came up behind quickly and a car crashed right into the rear of theirs. Spun them around in the road, over into the median, almost onto the lane on the other side of the freeway finally coming back onto the original roadway. And there the two cars finally stopped. Fortunately, he and his wife were not seriously hurt. The young man got out of the other car. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. But what happened? I fell asleep. None of the three were seriously injured. But here was this accident partly blocking this busy freeway. And cars kept going by, one after another, after another. Some just whizzing by, others would slow down, take a look at the scene, then speed up and carry on their way. For 30 minutes, those three individuals stood there before anyone cared enough to stop. The second experience, some time later he fell in his garden, a victim of a spasm in his back, and it just overtook him, he couldn't stand. And he laid there in his garden writhing with pain. His wife was on a trip, she was going to be gone for three days. The only near neighbor was gone for a week, and so he was alone. And he laid there all alone on the ground until the sun went down before the pain subsided enough and he was able to finally crawl away to get to his, the nearest telephone. It was from those two experiences that he learned a great lesson. He said, you know, it was much worse out on the highway than it was in the garden. In the garden, I was desperately alone. But he said, there is no loneliness worse than being alone because nobody cares. There is no loneliness so bad as loneliness in a crowd. And the bigger the church, the larger the institution, the greater the loneliness. What is Christian friendship? Christian friendship is caring and doing something about the loneliness of others. Have you done that lately? There is someone out there in your school, at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your church, who is desperately lonely this morning. There is someone out there who would be here this morning if you cared enough, not to just invite them, but to befriend them. 
Christian friendship overlooks differences. Now, friendship typically looks for people like us. Friendship tends to pick people whom I especially look up to, people preferably with a little higher status or at least equal with mine. Friendship can be cruelly exclusive. There's hardly anything better than friendship, nor anything worse, because the exclusiveness of friendship makes people feel unwanted. There is nothing less Christian than a clique. Religious bodies can be extremely cruel in their friendships. They call people who are not members of their little group outsiders. Outsiders. Very few outsiders have ever been one. Not if they thought that they had been pushed outside. Oh, there's love in those friendship circles. There's love in the circle, but very little of it gets out. A friendship circle, I believe, is Christian only if it is open-ended. And any group, if you're a part of it, that doesn't open itself to let other people in ought to examine whether or not it is Christian friendship. Christian friendship refuses exclusivism. People who feel excluded will go someplace else where they are invited into the circle of fellowship. Christian friendship doesn't look down on anyone. John, the 15th chapter and the 15th verse, the first part. John 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. Listen, dear worshiper, this morning. If Christ is willing to treat us as equals, how dare we look down on anyone? If Jesus didn't look down on you, how can you be Christian and look down on your fellow man? The Christian dearly loves atheists. The Christian loves Muslims. He loves Buddhists. He loves Hindus. The real Christian just loves alcoholics. The true Christian loves homosexuals. If the perfect Jesus didn't look down on me, I surely have no right to look down on anyone. I could not look down on anyone because of age. Young people tend to reject old people, but don't kid yourself. Old people tend to reject young people, only they claim it's on the basis of principle. We could not look down on anyone because of a difference in status. Christian employers don't look down on their employees and treat them as slaves. Jesus called us friends and not servants. Christian teachers don't look down on their students. Christian A students don't look down on D students. Christians of one color don't look down on people of other colors. The great Booker T. Washington was in Alabama, putting all of his energy into founding the Tuskegee Institute, of which he was president. Walking down the road one day in an exclusive section of town, a lady hailed him from her mansion. She said, hey boy, would you like to earn a few dollars chopping wood for me? Washington said nothing. He simply smiled, he took off his coat, he rolled up his sleeves, he went out to the wood pile, he chopped the wood. And he carried it into the house, and he stacked it neatly by the fireplace, and then he went on his way. As soon as he had left, the servant came to the lady of the house, and she said, Did you know that was Booker T. Washington? The woman was exasperated, deeply embarrassed, and ashamed. And to her credit, she went to the Institute and apologized profusely. Please, sir, forgive me for the way I treated you. Ah, said Washington, 
It's perfectly all right, madam. There's no apology needed. I enjoy a little manual labor. And besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. And he made a friend that day. The woman was so impressed with his humility, with his graciousness, she gathered her wealthy friends, and together they donated thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute. And so Christian friendship doesn't look down. Christian friendship requires continuous contact, and I think that's one place where we go so desperately wrong. The 15th verse again, John 15, verse 15, the last part. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. All things I have made known unto you. Do you get the implication from that? Everything that Jesus knew, he passed on to his disciples. You don't do that in a moment. That takes involvement, it takes communication, it takes continuous contact. Can you imagine what an amazing experience it must have been to be one of Jesus' disciples? Could you imagine what that must have been like? What an amazing experience, walking with Jesus for three and a half years, talking to Jesus every day, listening to his words every day, eating together, thousands of meals together, working together, praying together, continuous contact. Jesus dealt that way with his friends. But sometimes in the church today, we hardly make contact. There's a story about the man who came in and sat down in a very proper church with his hat on. The deacons were quite upset. What are we going to do? This poor fellow, he sits with his hat on. Finally, one usher drew the short straw, and he was designated to approach the man. He walked up and he whispered to the man, and he said, Did you know that you have your hat on, sir? Oh, yes, he said. I know I have my hat on. I've been attending this church for two months now, and I figured it was the only way I could get anybody to speak to me. Sometimes, even as a Christian group, we make so little contact with each other. I know the times of, you know, this whole COVID pandemic, I think Satan's so happy that he wants people separated, you know, and not to have communication with each other and to touch each other. And I miss the times we used to have you know, the beginning of our service, we'd go around and have a few minutes where we would greet each other, shake one another's hand, welcome them to the church. And some people, I understand, are a little uncomfortable with that because they think it's a little irreverent. But I miss the opportunity to get to spend that time together. And I've been in churches where they'll give, you know, they'll bake a loaf of bread or make some homemade granola or do something like that to all of their visitors. And of course, we have potlucks here. We have them a couple times a month. I think it would be nice if we did it every Sabbath because there's always visitors, maybe here for the first time, maybe they're from out of town. It's a good opportunity for them to actually connect with the people and to make friends. But however we do it, how important it is to have some excuse, some opportunity to get to know each other. Some people are afraid. Well, it's hard for me to reach out and befriend people. It, it may feel awkward. Or maybe they won't like me. Or maybe it just won't make a difference anyhow. That's all very possible. But here's where we can all take a lesson from the sun. The sun produces incredible amounts of heat, of energy. The core of the sun is 27 million degrees. Now how they know that, I have no idea. But that's what the scientists say, 
27 million degrees. Well, we can appreciate it in Arizona because we know it's a dry heat, right? <laughs> the surface of the sun cools down to where it's only 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But you know, most all of that enormous amount of heat that the sun sends out is wasted in outer space. Here we are in this earth 92 million miles away from the sun. And just a minute fraction, less than one billionth of that heat and energy, less than one billionth of it falls upon something like this earth that so desperately needs warmth. And maybe a lot of the friendships that you put out will never be reciprocated. But once in a while, it will fall on somebody so desperately in need of warmth. There are so many people in this community who have attended or been members of this church who ought to be attending now and aren't. I wish that you would make it a matter of prayer to go out and find one or two such persons and befriend them and invite them to come into worship with you. Now, it's true that if you like a man, he may not return your affection, but one thing is sure, he's going to admire your judgment. He's going to think that you're thinking pretty straight if you think quite a lot of him. And that's not a bad place to begin a friendship. And finally, don't ever use friendship. If you understand, don't use friendship. Oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to smile and I'm going to tell somebody that I really love them and that they're tremendously important so we can get another member attending in our church and I can get a star in my crown. Oh, folks, how we have adulterated friendship. And people are so quick to pick it out. A friend is somebody not that you use for some other purpose. A friend is somebody that you love simply because they're a person. Christian friendship requires contact. It requires continuous contact. You may have visited a non-attending member. You told them that you missed them, that you loved them, that you wanted them back. But the person didn't come and you just left it right there. Do you realize that they probably think you weren't being sincere? There is so much pretended friendship in this world. From the Avon lady, to the car salesman, to the telemarketer, to the huckster on TV, and how about the politicians? Everybody pretends to be our friend. If we as Christians really could have an exercise, the real article, how people would love us, how people would desire to fellowship with us. But remember, they will first draw back from us because people have to test us before they know that they can trust us. Are you a trustworthy friend? There's somebody out there who would be here in church if you cared enough to befriend them. This morning, above everything else, first of all, give your heart to Jesus. When you have befriended Jesus and spend that time with him like the disciples spent every day spending time with Jesus, you will, from the way that he has befriended you, know how to go out and be a Christian friend. To others. Sometimes I think that God made one animal just to teach us how to be friends. Take a lesson. When this expert on friendship comes meeting you down the street 20 feet away, his tail will start to wag. And if you reach down and touch him, he'll shiver all over. Why do people like dogs? Because dogs like people. I remember our first dog. We got Fuzzy at a flea market. No, she didn't come with fleas. Just the cutest little ball of fur and a bundle of energy. And when we brought Fuzzy home, I got down on the rug with this little friend maker. 
And you know, there wasn't any part of me in which she was disinterested. She was interested in all 10 of my fingers. She was interested in walking through my hair when my head got down on the carpet. And as I laid my head there, there was this nicest little tunnel between my chin and my shoulder that she just kind of came and went and used it as her little window to explore the world. I liked that dog because she was interested in me. And if people find that you are interested in them more than they're just being interested in you, people long for that kind of friendship. Let's befriend each other in this church with Christian friendship. Let's befriend others as Christ befriends us. Let's get busy, folks, and reclaim some of the disheartened and discouraged folk out there through friendship. Remember, there is someone who would be in church if you would befriend them. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. I believe we have a real need in our churches to befriend others. Those who are visiting to make them feel welcome, to make a connection. Those who come only occasionally to encourage them, to befriend them. Those who may come regularly, who maybe we just aren't drawn to quite as much. Let's give friendship a chance. Step out of your comfort zone. Make new friends. Give it a try. Those who are discouraged, who maybe have stopped attending for whatever reason, let's reach out to them in friendship, Christian friendship. Folks, I've been preaching to myself today. I want to make a difference. I want to be a better friend in my church, in my neighborhood, in my community. I want to be, as we just sang, I want to be like Jesus. Won't you join me today? By this shall all know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Shall we pray? Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we serve a God who longs to be our friend and who is such a wonderful friend, compassionate, giving, forgiving, wanting to spend time with us. Lord, we want to be that kind of friend to others. Give us the love for others that you have for us and for all people. Help us to learn to love people regardless of the differences. Whatever reasons they have for those who are different than us or maybe those who have stopped attending church, whatever the reasons are, Lord, where there's been division, Lord, help us to reach out in true Christian love and friendship and to win these people back to you, Lord. Help us to be more and more like Jesus, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.